It's Friday, May 15, 2020. You are welcome to News 360 Live here on TV3. My name is Aisha Yaku. My name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up tonight. Spray and coil. Deluxe acrylic paint. And Napa Foods. My Life Insurance. Shortage of hydroxychloroquine in some health facilities across the country puts the lives of over 2,000 persons living with rheumatoid arthritis at risk. Government to facilitate transportation of all Ghanaians stranded abroad back home. Also coming up, President Akufuado says government will expand health infrastructure as he cuts sword for commencement of work on abandoned Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital Maternity Block. And in business tonight, the Bank of Ghana to finance government's budget up to the tune of some 10 billion CDs. Meanwhile, Central Bank maintains policy rate at 14.5%. On the international front, Brazil's health minister resigns after less than a month over disagreements with handling of escalating a coronavirus crisis. We have these tales of these plus sports and entertainment coming up over the next 60 minutes here on News 360. Stay with us. We're live on 3FM 92.7. That's on Facebook, on also on 3news.com and DSTV channel 279. Let's go on to our first story this evening. A shortage of that's chloroquine in some health facilities across the country is putting the lives of over 2,000 persons with rheumatoid arthritis at risk. Now, this is because the essential drug is currently being used to treat persons who have contracted COVID-19. Now, some patients who spoke to TV3's Joseph Armstrong fear they may lose their lives if nothing is done to increase supply of the drug. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most common autoimmune disease affecting both the young and old. It is a chronic progressive disease causing inflammation in the joints, resulting in painful deformity and immobility, especially in the figures, wrists, feet, and ankles. In Ghana, about 2,000 persons living with the condition in the greater Accra region assess treatment at the rheumatological clinic at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital and other health facilities. Hydrozin chloroquine is an essential drug used commonly for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. However, with the drug being used to treat persons who have contracted COVID-19, there has been a shortage. Gifty is a single mother living with the condition. She is currently on admission at Kolebu Teaching Hospital. She fears she may lose her life due to the unavailability of the drug. Because of me, I can't do anything. Mommy, I'm feeling me. Especially the person I'm going to do. I can't do anything. I can't afford to buy the drugs, and without it, I feel severe pains. I will be grateful if the public can support me. Other persons living with the condition shared their frustration. They called on government to increase the supply of the drug and not only focus on persons who have contracted COVID-19. I fear in no time I'm going to find myself in a very difficult situation, being a mother of four very young children and finding myself in that situation is going to be a heartbreaking for the kids. In Tiamat say yen ye bin to baby I'll be near beaton so almost eight hundred and a seven hundred. We are pleading with government to support us in getting the drugs. Yes, I abind say Ministry of Health, so much and kaya po macho. Se dro no met me and yebi am a rheumatoid for a rheumatologist and a lecturer at the University of Ghana Medical School, Dr. Jifade said if nothing is done to increase the supply of the drug, persons living with the condition could become critically ill and may die. It looks as if one group has been sacrificed for the other. Mm. We are well aware that it's needed for the COVID-19, even mm. though the evidence now seems um, a bit 
debatable whether mm. it's really that effective for the COVID-19 patients. Mm. So if that's the case, there must be adequate measures put in place for the patients who need it as well to also have it. So you don't sacrifice one, one group for the other. She wants government to give equal attention to both persons who have contracted COVID-19 and persons living with rheumatoid arthritis. Chloroquine has been a drug that has been manufactured in this country before. Mm. And also chloroquine is just a derivative from that. So they, I would have thought that by now, especially if they are still using it for the COVID patients, we should start manufacturing it locally so that it will be readily available at prices that are affordable for the patients mm. and also um, enough for okay. the COVID-19 yeah. patients to use. How long have you been out of stock? I think about four weeks. Four weeks? Yeah. Mm. So what is happening? Do you have people coming to ask for it? Okay, we have people coming to ask for it, but then... Unfortunately, we don't have. This has been the situation in most of the health facilities and also pharmacies we have visited so far. We are told that a hydrochloroquine is out of supply now. And patients living with such condition are calling on the government to help in the supply of such drugs to help them undergo treatment. Joseph Armstrong Gould, Alibi, TV3, Accra. Government says plans are far advanced to facilitate the transportation of all Ghanaians stranded abroad back home. This was disclosed by Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister Charles Oredu, who says a list of all who want to return to Ghana has been presented to the President for further action. The coronavirus pandemic which brought the world to a standstill forced Ghana to close its borders on March 22. Countries the world over imposed similar restrictions on travel. Some, however, have begun to ease them. Countries like the United Kingdom and South Africa have successfully repatriated their citizens from Ghana. In view of this, the government of Ghana initiated processes to bring stranded Ghanaians back home. Any decision that is taken should be backed by the data. So we spoke to, the second the president had a meeting with all the ambassadors through Zoom, you know, conference call, and he taxed them to collect this data. A deadline was given, the deadline was yesterday. So as of today, we are still processing the data that you know we've received from all the over 63 uh, uh, embassies and, uh, and consulates that we have. So that, that that is still being done. Once we have, once we've processed the data, we'll forward it to His Excellency the President. Then the decision will be taken. He also dispelled rumors on social media that government was charging passengers before processing them for their return. Nobody has been asked to commit even one dollar or one peso to this cause. We've not asked anybody to pay. What we've already heard was that some Ghanaians are saying that they have the capacity to pay themselves. Some are even saying that the employ employers have chartered aircraft for them you know, to come. What they only need from us is to just open the borders for the aircraft to land. We've not asked, as of now, we've not asked anybody to pay a peso. Meanwhile, Ghanaian embassies in China have donated medical supplies to the Ministry of Health to help the country combat the COVID-19 pandemic. The items included ventilators, N95 surgical nose masks, medical gowns, among others, worth over $400,000. Receiving the items on behalf of the Health Ministry, Deputy Health Minister Dr. Bernard Okoboy expressed his appreciation and called for other bodies to emulate the gesture. I'll take this opportunity to encourage all NGOs, civil society organizations, all agencies, whether public or private, to come on board so that we can sustain the supply chain and make sure that we protect our health workers and protect ourselves as a people. The stigma is not necessary. We have to make sure we don't discriminate against people who have had a history of COVID-19. Well, as you do know, the regional breakdown of the latest uh, COVID-19 cases has it that Greater Accra leads with some 4,204 and the Ashanti region 788, Central 194, Eastern region, uh, you have it there, uh, six, that's uh, 99, and now the Western region 61. Western North Region 57, Voto Region 34, Upper East Region uh, also there with 26. But one of the concerns indeed uh, has been raised with the Western Region right now because I have an update on that particular figure, Western Region now, because uh, 23 new COVID-19 cases have been recorded 
in the Western region as of today. That's Friday, May 15, bringing the region's case count to 87. That has not been updated yet on the Ghana Health Services website, but my colleague in the Western region, our Western regional correspondent, Eric J, has the details of that. He joins us via Skype. Eric, what do we know about these new 23 cases we have? Thank you very much, Alfred. Um, rightly so, our case count has moved from um, 64 from Tuesday to 87 as such today. And what it means is that we've recorded 23 new cases. And these new cases are coming from, thus far, the most active assemblies here in the Western region, i.e. the regional capital of Sekedi Takrade Metropolitan Assembly, then the mining hub, Takwa Ishiaye Municipal Assembly. The last time that I gave an update and from the update that we had from the Regional Health Directorate, these two assemblies were neck to neck. Each had 19 cases. But if you look at the new update that we have been given, that of STMA has moved from 19 to 34. So it means that um, we've recorded 15 new cases. Again, the Takwa Isaiah Municipal Assembly has also moved from 19 to 27. It means that we have eight new cases. So yes, Alfred, um, as of today, we have recorded 23 new positive cases. Again, if you look at the update sheet, um, they said that they are saying that we have some 26 suspected cases as of today. Then again, you know, when this uh, issue became really dicey, the regional health directorate mounted some screening base at all the three entry points into the western region. And if you look at the tracker, they are telling us that um, so far they've been able to screen a total of 605,020 persons. Uh, in the last 24 hours, they've been able to screen some 21,536 persons who entered into the region. Again, um, mm. we are told that currently there is an assessment ongoing at the Takrade airport to look at the suitability of reopening the place up for domestic flights. Alfred. Great stuff and detail there. Eric, as always, thank you so much uh, with that comprehensive report. Eric Yawaje is a uh, Western Regional Correspondent then, giving us updates of the 23 additional cases recorded, of, that's of COVID-19 recorded in the Western region. From the Western region, we move to the Ashanti region where the spike in cases of COVID-19 in Obwase is pushing local assemblies in the municipality to recommend a curfew. The municipality currently has over 400 cases of the virus. William Evans Inkum has more in the following report. The Obuasi Central Markets is one of the hotspots for COVID-19, recording its first community spread. After a brief closure of the markets, traders are back, but operating under a shift system to enforce social distancing protocols. Most of the traders were also spotted wearing nose masks. Stigmatization has, however, become a major hindrance to the fight against the coronavirus. Obuasi has tested more number than any other districts or uh, municipal. That is why we have seen that we have community spread. So they should stop pointing fingers at, at, at Obwasi. And to my own people of Obwasi, we should stop pointing fingers at the authority at center. When you go to other uh, region or communities or other towns and they tell you, are you from Obwasi, go back, you feel uh, intimidated. The spike in cases of COVID-19 is pushing local assemblies in the municipality to recommend a curfew. If our leaders uh, discuss value, assess it, and they realize that it, is, uh, it will help, and they ask us to implement it, fine. But is the imposition of a curfew the solution? <laughs> The imposition of a curfew will help contain the spread because some traders are not observing the safety protocols. Oh, you sanitizer, what can I do? Lockdown, I say, curfew, no. I swim for so much. The curfew wouldn't be beneficial. The COVID 19 team in Obuasi is currently managing information to achieve optimum results, especially in the move to secure private facilities to serve as isolation centers. Well, effective Monday, May 18, anyone without a nose mask cannot 
enter markets and lorry stations. And in Koko, this is a directive from the Kwe West Municipal Chief Executive Yao Oswado. These measures, according to the MCE, is to further strengthen the status of the municipality, which is yet to record a COVID-19 positive case. Despite its central location to the two major epicenters of COVID-19 in Ghana, the Greater Accra and Kumasi, the Kweu West Municipal Assembly is yet to record a single case of COVID-19. Hundreds of contacts traced to the municipality have tested negative. The Municipal Chief Executive, Yao Fusuadu, credited the feat to the Assembly's proactiveness. We've taken a number of people to court. We've taken priests who are breaking uh, the regulation to court. We've, we've taken hotel owners, some swimming pool owners, and uh, we've taken some hawkers to court already. So the law is already there, and if you break them, we'll take you to court. To sustain the gangs chalked, the assembly is enforcing a directive for all residents to wear nose masks. Persons who refuse to wear them cannot assess market centers and lorry parks in Nkoko. From Monday, if you are not wearing face masks, you cannot go to any market or lorry station or you cannot join any moving commercial vehicle if you are not wearing face mask. So it's a regulation which is going out today so that we will insist on that. There will be police uh, and other security people checking this at the lorry parks and the entrance to the markets. But what happens to those who would flout the directive? The rules are there. The, the, <laughs> if you violate these rules, the executive instrument of the president of the republic is there. We have already been pre uh, prosecuting people under these regulations in Kwa West. The municipal health director, Celestina Asante, urged the public to help contain the pandemic by strictly adhering to the COVID-19 safety protocol. Droplet is from our nose, it's from our mouth. So when you max and then I max, I'm not transmitting mine to you. You're also not transmitting yours to me. So in a very short while, if everybody should max, it won't take us that long. The disease will be contained and we should do it. Celestina Sante further advocated for the wearing of masks at home. If it is not your own self-contained house, but it is household, you know, a rented apartment that you are sharing, whilst even in that house, put on your nose mask because about 80% to 85% of, of our patients are asymptomatic, meaning that they are not really presenting clinical signs and symptoms. So, if you are sharing the same household with your other co-tenants, and a person is asymptomatic, how will you know? So going forward from today, everybody should put on their nose masks, unless you are going to sleep. And now some parents, students and heads of educational institutions are looking forward to the resumption of academic work. But is it time for schools to reopen? Grace Hamwa Asari has been finding out. Parents, teachers and students have looked forward to the president announcing the reopening of schools and other educational facilities. But this does not appear to be happening anytime soon as the president, during his last address, extended the ban on public gatherings to May 31 whilst enforcing strict adherence to the COVID protocols. The World Health Organization recommends vigilance at all levels in schools with consideration on ways to set up classrooms to keep children physically separate during certain times of the day, such as play time or lunch time. For some players in the education sector, they are prepared to ensure adherence to safety protocols on COVID-19 should schools reopen. If we have to come to school, I'm even thinking about it that the school has a, a, a formidable structure that can control the children more than even the market that is in place now. Because that place, nobody controls anybody. Yeah. They are on their own. But for school, we can at least control the children, even if by reducing the class size, having a shift system where the children, even some of them can come and then the others can come later. It's, that structure can be in place to help. Headmaster of the Wisdom of Wisdom School, Reverend Francis Tete, fears the prolonged closure of schools will have a negative impact on children's development. And if you realize that from the time the lockdown came and up to now, the, the kind of work they are producing will tell you that no, the children, when they went to they were not doing anything, they were just watching television. 
So really, this will tell you that if we are to be in a house for six months, when we come back, something serious is going to happen. Mm. The children, all that they've learned. And in the situation where we are even implementing a new curriculum, yeah. it, it's, it's very serious. Education and public safety experts, however, argue it is not safe for schools to resume. We think that the ministry should by now be engaging the relevant stakeholders, the teacher unions, I mean parents and um, student leaders, as to the possible options available to them so that they will be able to think through it and then have a roadmap to uh, the reopening of, of our schools. Executive Secretary of the Institute for Education Studies, Peter Pate Anti, wants a convincing strategy from the educational facilities. The shift system might be useful. Uh, what its implication on academic resources would be enormous because we would then have to look at the, our teachers, the number of teachers that we have, whether the same teachers would be doing the, the two shifts or not. We will have to look at the uh, um, the infrastructure available for us, we have to look at the um, supervision and monitoring and all the, those things that come into play when we are running the normal system. For now, parents will have to support their children with home study as stakeholders deliberate on the way forward. Grace Hamwa Asari, TV3 News, Accra. And from the school's operators of nightclubs, and restaurants say they will strictly adhere to safety protocols on COVID-19 should the ban on social gathering be lifted. Chief Executive Officer of the Epos nightclub in Accra, Edward Panioto, is set to reduce the club's capacity of 300 people to 45 to ensure the safety of the patrons. Drinking bars and nightclubs have been directed to remain closed as part of efforts to curb the spread of COVID-19. Ahead of the decision, we sought to find out how prepared facilities in the hospitality industry are should a restriction on social gathering be lifted. Before the outbreak of COVID-19 in Ghana, the Airpost nightclub and pub located in Osu was hugely patronized. It has been closed to business for over a month. CEO of the facility, Edward Pani Otu, tells us he plans to reduce the sitting capacity of the club. We will only take, uh, let's say, 25 to 40 people so that uh, we maintain sanity. I don't want a case where one may be affected. Arrangements at the upper terrace and eatery have also been limited to a nine-table set arrangement instead of the usual 25-table set. We are not joking at all because no one wants to die. So uh, this time it's not about uh, customer rights, it's about uh, restriction. Preparations for a post-restriction era at the country kitchen restaurant also in Usu was no different. So when they are come and they are like three, four, we make them sit over here. But like one will sit here, one will sit here, one will sit here, and one will sit over there in order to observe the social distance. Yeah. That is why we have not laid anything on it. So when the customer comes inside, he knows that this particular one, they are not supposed to sit. However, operators at the China House fast food restaurant say they are not ready to take a risk. Assistant chef, Eric Aniewu says the eatery plans to wait even after restrictions are eased before allowing patrons in. Even though they like to sit to eat, but we, if it doesn't, because of the restriction, we can't allow them to sit. You don't have any, any, any choice because it's a life and death. The way makes reactions from patrons about lifting the restriction on social gatherings. I will I'll be very excited to move out into normalcy. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to do a lot of things. I miss the school environment, but the other part of me is scared about what's going to happen when students gather back together in the classroom. Am I going to get infected? Am I going to probably die? Executive Director of the Bureau of Public Safety, Nanayao Akwada, is not enthused with preparations towards easing restrictions. He has called on government to proceed with caution. If we do not 
review our case or management regime to increase the rate of recovery from the paltry 10% to somewhere in the range of 40%, any attempt to ease restrictions further could be very disastrous. We understand life must go on, but it must go on within a very necessary framework. Stakeholders in the various sectors of the economy are already being engaged to deliberate on safety measures that would not compromise the health of citizens when the ban on social gathering is lifted. A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Let's do business. My name is Nanekria Mensa Brampa. About 9,000 employees of hotels and guest houses, which operate under the umbrella of the Ghana Progressive Hoteliers Association, have been laid off because of the lack of patronage of the facilities. The development is as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has forced many other facilities to shut down completely or operate at minimal capacity. National President of the Association, Charles Edu Jemfi, explained that the association, which has a membership of 400, employed about 12,000 workers before the advent of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Let's go to the central bank now where it is to finance government's budget up to the tune of 10 billion cities. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ennis Addison, explained that the impact of COVID-19 on the economy makes it imperative to intervene. Meanwhile, the central bank has maintained the policy rate still at 14.5%. Today, under the banks of Ghana's asset purchase program, the bank has purchased a government of Ghana COVID-19 relief bond with a face value of 5.5 billion CDs at the monetary policy rate with a 10-year tenor and a moratorium of two years, principal and interest. The bank stands ready to continue with its asset purchase program up to 10 billion CDs in line with the current estimates of the financing gap from the COVID-19 pandemic. Although financial analysts support the move by the Bank of Ghana, they want government to be cautiously optimistic with its expenditure. When you finance government spendings, government takes this financing and must know what to do with it. What the government does with it must be something that catalyzes growth. It shouldn't be something that goes into unproductive ventures. Otherwise, it will be counterproductive and come back to haunt the inflation mandate. So once we have rightfully decided to fund government budget, government spendings must be well targeted. The Bank of Ghana has also announced relief measures to the specialized deposit taking institution sector. The Bank of Ghana has also announced that it will be giving liquidity support to savings and loans companies, finance houses, as well as microfinance institutions through the ARB Apex Bank. Uh, even though the Bank of Ghana is yet to allocate funds for this support it has announced, it says these financial institutions must justify why they need such funds. The bank has also extended the deadline for SDIs, that is microfinance institutions and rural and community banks to meet the new capital requirements to December 2021. This is expected to provide temporary relief to SDIs given current economic conditions. The bank has also reduced the 8% primary reserve ratio for savings and loans companies, finance house companies, and rural and community banks to 6%. Although inflation has increased from 7.8% to 10.6%, as well as the drastic drop in prices of oil, the central bank maintained the policy rate at 14.5%. Dr. Ennis Addison explains that the performance of Ghana's external sector remains strong despite the impact of COVID-19. 
Well, so really, what will this mean to the economy, maintaining the policy rate at 14.5%? Let's probe further and uh, let's speak with Professor John Gachi, who is the head of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Prof, good to have you this evening. Now, what impact will the maintenance of the policy rate, 14.5%, have on the economy in such times of COVID-19? Well, I don't think it will have um, uh, any significant impact uh, except that it gives, especially the commercial bank, uh, some kind of a certain thing within a short period of time that they will not be forced to reduce uh, their lending rate. You know, uh, as part of the overall policy by the Bank of Ghana to deal with the COVID-19, uh, commercial banks have been directed to reduce uh, their lending rate by two percentage points. You would need to wait and see how that is implemented and the impact it has uh, on the on the landscape uh, within the, the commercial banking sector and how it affects their lending portfolio. Right. That has not been affected yet. So that is why I think it has become very important to maintain the policy rate. Okay. Now, uh, again, when you look at our debt stock, should we be worried about our current debt stock now? 236.1 billion Ghana cities in the first quarter of 2020. Should we be bothered at all? Well, I think that is the total debt portfolio. Uh, but uh, uh, the first quarter is supposed to be 16.6 .6 billion uh, Ghana cities. We need to be worried uh, because... Uh, when you take the public financial management law, uh, when we are assessing the fiscal effects of our uh, financial management, we are supposed to be looking at not only the debt stock, not only the debt to GDP ratio, but we should also be looking at the tax revenue to GDP, and we should also be looking at the wage bill to tax revenue. And when you put all these things together, uh, you will realize that we are in a very fragile and a delicate situation when it comes to the management of our debt and its reflection on the entire fiscal management of the country. We are grateful for your time there, Professor John Gachi, head of the University of Cape Coast Business School. And talking about efforts also by the Bank of Ghana to support our savings and loans as well as finance houses and microfinance institutions. The Bank of Ghana says it's given some liquidity support for them and executive director of the Savings and Loans Association, Trinibua Kodiabwachi, has seen this as welcome news. We'll be giving you more updates in subsequent bulletins. You can log on to 3news.com for more news updates. My name is Nane Kriya Mensah Brampa. Alfred. Well, thank you. Thank you for the business news. Our President Kofuado is optimistic of a robust public health sector in a post-COVID-19 economy. He says the collective experiences and lessons drawn from the COVID-19 pandemic should serve as the foundation block in building a stronger health system. President was speaking at a ceremony to cut sword for work to resume on the maternity and children's block at the Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital, which has stored for the past 44 years. Here's a report by Benjamin Edu. The over 800-bed facility, which started in 1976, will be the largest investment made in the expansion of the hospital since its construction in 1954. Government has secured two credit agreements totaling 155 million euros from the Dutch Bank in Germany and the UK Export Finance to fund the project. Parliament approved the loan facilities in April 2019. President Akufuadu said the project will serve 12 regions in the country upon completion. I also indicated that Parliament has approved a 155 million euro loan to finish and equip the maternity and children's block of the Confuanochi Teaching Hospital. It will serve as a referral center for 12 of the 16 regions of our country. The finalization of this project is as very dear to my heart as it will have a positive impact on our country's drive towards achieving the SDG targets under maternal and child health. The president appealed to the public to adhere to the protocols and directives to contain the spread of COVID-19. Our policies are working. 
so let us all abide by them. I thus encourage each and every one of you in Asante Mai and the rest of Ghana during this era of the virus to observe the social distancing and enhanced hygiene protocols that I have outlined. Chief Executive Officer of the Confanoche Hospital, Dr. Ohineba Danso, announced plans to start testing COVID-19 cases at the hospital. Mr. President, as part of the national effort to help achieve same-day delivery of COVID-19 test results, I'm happy to announce that management has facilitated the laboratory services directorate here to complete the setup of a COVID-19 testing laboratory. This follows over three weeks of preparation with all the necessary physical infrastructure, equipment, and consumables, and very good test runs validated by the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research (KCCR). Full operations of this special lab will commence on Monday. The Minister of Health, Kweku Ajima Menu, assured of government's commitment to improve health infrastructure in the country. Eighteen projects have been approved in Parliament for health sector. Out of these 18, six of them are in Ashanti. Manson Kwanta, this big one we are seeing here, Kedie Suami, Robonso, Sabronum, and Obwasi to come. Altogether, since I joined as a health minister, Mr. President, 17 healthcare facilities have been commissioned nationally over the last three and a half years. And government intends to continue this drive in the coming years. The Confanoche Maternity Block will contain 10 theatres, intensive care units, in vitro fertilization, IVF unit, and a breastfeeding centre. Other facilities include a pediatric surgery unit, pharmacy, dedicated medical oxygen plant, and lecture halls. Another Electoral Commission says it is impossible for the election management body to conspire with any political party or institution to rig elections. In a statement signed by Acting Director Public Affairs of Arno, the Commission rejected claims by the Chairman of the NDC at a press briefing on Thursday, May 14. The statement reiterated that Ghana's electoral processes remain transparent at all levels. The Commission said as an independent body, it is mandated to conduct free, fair and transparent elections within the confines of the law and will continue to perform its functions such as such without fear or favour. The statement noted the Commission will strictly adhere to safety protocols spelt out by the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health when it starts registration for the new voters register. The Electoral Commission assured all stakeholders of its determination to deliver free, fair and credible presidential and parliamentary elections on December 7, 2020, as mandated by law. You are watching News 360. After the break, there's sports. Please stay with us.